We now, th we now start with the third session of the day. This session is devoted to operations and training aspects. The speakers for this session are Mr. Michael O'Hara Kelly, presently Senior Program Manager for Military Ruggedized Communication Equipment, Training Development, and the Network Integration Evaluation at DRS Technologies. Mr. Kelly will speak on battle command systems from the user's perspective. Mr. Sides spearheading the overall automation in order to achieve net centricity in the Indian Army. The General will be speaking about expectations from net centricity in the battlefield. Colonel Samir Chauhan is currently a senior fellow at CLAWS pursuing his studies on requirements of simulation-based training of the Indian Army. He has, served and he has served with his battalion in Operation Pavan in Sri Lanka, Operation Falcon along the LAC in Tavang, and in Operation Rakshak in Jammu and Kashmir. Colonel Samir will speak on the making of a digital warrior. To chair this session, we are honored to have Lieutenant General Aditya Singh. General Aditya Singh completed his education from Mayo College, Ajmer, and is a fourth generation army officer. He has had the unique distinction of commanding both the Southern Army as well as the Tri-Service Andaman and Nicobar Command. He has also served as a member in the National Security Advisory Board. I now hand over to the chairperson. Thank you and uh, welcome to all the panelists and uh, being the last session I know the kind of interest it would normally generate but the good news is that I've just been told that we have to vacate the hall by six o'clock and therefore your attention span must be compressed into the next 45 minutes because there is a wind-up session also. Uh, which means that I will also cut short my remarks. But I think what I need to speak about is that training and operations is the most important. You can have the best technology, but in this age of digitization, these acquire a new dimension. And I'll give you two, a simple example. If you didn't know your 7.62 millimeter rifle, you could only do damage within a realm of 300 meters. If you didn't know or spoke in a lax manner on your ANPRC radio set, you could do damage within 20 kilometers. If your tank, gun or artillery gunner made an error, it was a limited error. In the digitized battlefield, this scope for damage, scope for advantage is immense on both aspects. The kind of vulnerabilities that grow with your situational awareness and reach over this wide area are tremendous and I think training and operational aspects therefore become crucial. We also have to think of new facets which are coming in and I will give you just one example of the insider threat. Just see the greatest embarrassment being caused to nations by the WikiLeaks, Mr. Bradley Manning or the recent Snowden episode. So please understand the kind of democratized world, global democratization that the digital battlefield provides for you. It provides you tremendous advantages, but it also provides you a tremendous potential for disaster. And remember, this disaster will come from your weakest link. And therefore, when we are talking of operations and training, and we have got a very interesting panel of speakers, you will keep this into account as implementing it in the Indian scenario is vital. Uh, I will request the speakers to please keep to their limited period and I 
as I mentioned earlier, have to make sure that I finish off the session in 45 minutes. So I think with much ado, Michael, the stage is yours. They have an issue with the fire. Great. I don't need that fire. I don't need a microphone. I just need your attention for about 15 minutes. And I want to tell you what I've learned about Battle Command from my experience of 36 years in the United States Army. Working with soldiers, working with liaison officers, and operational assignments worldwide. And I'm going to tell you the one thing that you got to walk away from this presentation with. It's all about the user. You can have, as the gentleman said, the best equipment in the world. But if the user can't use it, it won't get used. I love it in a military organization. When you get a new piece of equipment that comes in, no training, no idea how to use it. It's very expensive. If you break it, you're going to have to pay for it. And so what most of my sergeants would do is put it in a wall locker and threaten every one of the soldiers, you touch that, I'll kill you. <laughs> but it's a great piece of equipment, I'll kill you. I want to thank this organization for allowing me to speak today. And I want to thank all of you for hanging around this long. I'm going to be entertaining. I'm going to be brief. And I've got just a few points to make. Are we up? Dang it, now i got to use these slides. Okay. Be careful, be careful with your ears here. The thing turns. Yeah, oh, watch out now. Hurt somebody here. Kind of got one of those voices. Okay, so what I want to talk a little bit about here is the user perspective. And what I've learned, as I said earlier, and what I want to walk away with is about three points here, and I'll summarize those at the end, that kind of talks to what's going on with battle command and a user interface. So how many of you all have been in the field, tired, wet, cold, hungry, been out there a couple of weeks, things are not going well, your battle command system's not working very well. <laughs> Surprise. Can't talk on the radios. Surprise. And you got everybody and their brother screaming at you because it doesn't work. Well, I'll tell you why it doesn't work. It's because we haven't considered the user. So why DRS? When I retired after 36 years, I was a little construction company. And I was going to do that for the rest of my life. And DRS called me up, and I had an association with them when I was still uh, in the Army and with the government. And they asked me to come to work for them for one reason. One reason. As the president of the company told me, he said, I have a lot of really great, smart, young engineers. It's like the folks sitting over here stacking uh, water bottles uh, to occupy their time. He said, I want you to sit down with them and I want you to explain to them how the Army works. Because they come up with some great ideas, but they don't know what it's like. Tired, wet, cold, hungry, so on and so forth. And I said, that's a heck of a job. That's kind of my dream job. I'd love to do that. And so I went to work for DRS and working with those engineers and continuing to work with soldiers as we develop the next generation of battle command systems for the Army focused on the user. How did I get there from here? I have, I have three slides I'm going to go through real quick that the marketing people said I had to show or, they, or uh, there would be dire consequences, okay? So here we go. Are you ready? Ready? Here we go. Okay, we're uh, part of Finn Mechanica. We're a great company. Buy stuff from us. And uh, we've got a lot of experience. We've been with the United States Army. We've been with the U.K. We've been with a lot of different places. And our stuff works really well. And the last comment on this slide is what I'm going to focus on today, and I want you all to take, away, take that away if you would, please. The right information to the right person at the right time 
And here's the kicker, the right format. Because as, a, as many of our esteemed leaders have talked about this morning, you get this deluge of information coming at you. How do you sequence and cluster it so that you can use it? How do you take data, turn it into information, and turn it into knowledge that allows you to confidently execute the commander's intent? And I spent a lot of years trying to understand how to do that. The information system, that's its job, and we're in the information business. And so we're empowering everyone from the soldier on the ground all the way to the brigade, division, corps, commander with the right information at the right time, the way that they want it. And this is the area that we need to go into, and this is why the user's interface is so important. If I'm a core commander, I have a particular user interface I like to use. If I'm a soldier, I have another one. So let me explain what that means. If I'm a commander at brigade division level, and I'm inside the tactical operations center, and I have all the screens and information that's coming to me, and I'm making decisions and I'm looking at the terrain. I step out of the command operations center. I get on my platform and I drive to the battle. Completely different battle command system on the platform. I get to the battle. I get off the platform and I walk forward. And I have a soldier-like look at the battlefield, which is a completely different again. And so I, as a commander have to do the mental gymnastics of taking what I saw in the top, translating it to what I see on the vehicle, translating it to what I see when I walk at the forward edge of the battlefield. It's crazy. We need one ubiquitous battle command system from the highest level to the lowest level, and we tailor it to the user's needs. So, Critical thinking. Now, in my career, I had a lot of creative thinkers, but I didn't have a lot of critical thinkers. So they would come up with some pretty creative ways to go about fighting the battle. But in the end, it was always my job to work with them and my staff to be able to understand the essence of the battle, the essence of the mission, to take away all the things that didn't matter, focus on the things that did matter, and execute execute, execute, or as I like to say, attack, attack, always attack. Don't like to go into the defense. So what are we doing to enable that commander, that soldier, to be able to understand the commander's intent and be able to execute and attack with confidence, trusting the systems that they're using and the leadership that's behind them that if they do their job, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And what I also ask you to do is to think a little bit about what I'm pointing out here on this side. Because one of the things I'll tell you about soldiers, and, I, and, and everybody in here that's been a soldier knows it, we all learn in different ways. Some guys I can draw a picture. Some guys I can talk to. Some guys have to hear it. Some guys have to read it. All of us have different ways of assimilating information. So I think it's important that when we consider the user in the mission command, battle command system that we put together, we be able to tailor that information to a way that they best receive it. Commanders don't have a lot of time on a battlefield. You have to make decisions quickly, and you want to make the right decision. So how do you learn best? How do you attain information best? And if I was ever successful at all in the United States Army, it was because the first thing I did is looked at how my commander took information in. How did they read what I gave them? Did they want pictures? Did they want graphics? Did they want words? How did they do that? And once I understood how they got it, that's the way they got it every time. It didn't matter how I wanted it. It mattered how they wanted it. That was what was important. Okay. So I spent about... Uh, well, I've had a really great, a great life and a great career with the Army, but the last uh, 10 years or so uh, were really exciting. I worked on something called the Future Combat Systems, where the Army, we, the American Army, was going to redefine and redo how everything was, everything was done. We were going to forget everything we'd ever done before, and we were going to do it in a new way. We were going to be very creative about it, and we were going to have some interesting relationships with industry and 
we were going to call in a lot of really, really smart people, and we were all going to sit around, we were going to figure this thing out so we could fight the network and so we could make our force lighter and easier. Well, you all know how that went. About $9 billion later, we don't have an FCS program anymore. I left that job, and I went to work on FBCV2, the Battle Command System for the United States Army. First thing I did is I walked in there, and they told me, it said, it takes 40 hours of training for a user. Really? 40 hours? That's incredible. What is it I'm trying to teach them in 40 hours? Well, I'm trying to turn them into computer programmers because they're, they're basically using DOS commands to interpret what's on the battle command system. I'm sitting going, they're all walking around with smartphones. Everybody's got an iPhone. Why don't we make this system like an iPhone? Oh, 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 oh. don't want to do that. Why not? Why not? Why don't we want to do that? Well, we've never done it that way, and it sounds hard. No, we're going to do it that way. So what I see up here on the left-hand side is kind of some of the stuff that I did, all right? And that may look like the old acquisition system that we're all familiar with, but I tell you what, if I had to do over again, I would have done what you see on the right-hand side. I would have first focused on the user, and I think that's always important. Go out there and ask that guy, what do you want? And how do you want it? And how can I get it to you? I'd pay a lot more attention to the commercial world. Not that I wasn't, but I would have been really hard on the people in the acquisition business and the developing business to give me that iPhone or give me that Samsung Android interface because the soldier's already trained. I don't have to send him to 40 hours of education. He already knows how to use an iPhone. There's not a heck of a lot of difference between an iPhone and what I'm trying to do in this battle command system. They can figure it out. Matter of fact, when I left the job, we had a user's uh, jury where I brought in users, and I sat them down in a room, and I gave them the system, and I didn't give them any instruction at all. Any instruction at all. And I said, here, use it. And it was so close to a commercial cell phone, a smartphone, within five minutes, they were sending messages, receiving messages, drawing graphics, the whole nine yards. This last one down here I would emphasize to everyone is, is in the American uh, Army, we have uh, a lot of different contractors. So we have a contractor that does brigade, have a contractor that does battalion and, and uh, company and soldier stuff, and they don't talk to each other because it's all about market share, and so it's all about money. And so these systems don't work well together. But from a user's perspective, I want a common data dictionary. I want a common geospatial interface. I want a common user interface that I can tailor to me. I want to talk just a little bit about the NIE, the Network Integration Experiment. I spent the whole last year, okay, so I retire. I take off a week, come to work for DRS. First thing they do is they send me out to Fort Bliss, Texas, okay? About 115 degrees, middle of nowhere, kind of like just like Abu Dhabi, Alain out in that way. And so I sat out there for a year with soldiers and with some money and with some engineers, and we developed solutions for the Army's capability gap. And so what, one of the first things I did was develop a company command post that went in the back of, in this particular case, an MRAP Cayman. And then I went and worked with the engineers and put it in the back of a Bradley fighting vehicle and it looks kind of congested in there, and it was, and that's me telling uh, General Dragon how it all works together and stuff, and so we continue to work. But significant to that whole effort was the user interface, how the user uses this stuff. And so when we did the layout and the architecture within there, it was all about how does the user want to interface with this. And it was pretty simple. Make it like Microsoft Office. You know, like you have Excel, PowerPoint, and Word, well, have logistics, intel, maneuver, artillery, and you just press across there. And it's nice to be able to see all of that in one screen, okay? So you don't have to, have to figure that all out. One of the key technologies that allowed us to do that that we, uh, that we had out there at the NIE was something called a data distribution unit. And basically what this thing became known as is the Swiss knife of communications gear. All the contractors come to Fort Bliss to sell the Army the things that they want for the next game.
how all that stuff worked and how that stuff went together. Right now, we're currently working on a, on a Max Pro uh, situation that allows us to uh, have sensor uh, communications, mission command, and platform batronics all hooked together again using a couple of devices that DRS makes. And I'm not here, well, maybe a little bit, to sell something. But what I'm really here to do is to talk to some of the same problems that we have discussed this morning with the panels about how do you take legacy, current, and future stuff and make it all work together. Because what we're learning in the American Army and my experience at uh, Fort Bliss, Texas, is that if you can't tie it all together, you very quickly become obsolete. You can't afford to buy new stuff all the time, so you have to buy it in increments. And when you buy it in increments, you have to be able to fit it all together, and so that's where we were coming from. And then last but not least was taking it to the tactical edge of the soldier. And I'll tell you where we went with this was basically a smartphone in a sleeve that allowed it to be connected to the, uh, to the network. And the idea was is that the interface that was used on the smartphone was the same interface, same look, same... Same look and feel as the uh, graphical user interface that's on the uh, platform and inside the Tactical Operations Center. What we were able to do with the DDU as an example here, again, was to be able to show how we could take a lot of disparate equipment and bring it together. And that was just important for that particular concept uh, and what we were trying to do there. Uh, we used it as a tactical server. We run a lot of VMware on it, things like that. But it brought it all together for us. What we're really excited about is the next generation of equipment that we're bringing. And it's all based upon the stuff I've been talking about, this whole idea of a user interface and a, and a common application. And basically what you have inside the MFOX, my colleague Jay will talk a little bit more about that. But it's, it's common hardware that you can use on all the different platforms, from the soldier all the way to the tactical operations center. You only have to train your maintainers on one piece of equipment. Everything that's uh, in there that's running the software is all running the same stuff. I only point that out to you as an example of how it could be, not as how it, how it, how it you know, I'm not going to say this is the end all to be all, but I can tell you here's an example of how it's working right now. You can build your own system which a lot of the leaders within the American Army are pretty big on right now because one of the things you can do with MFOX is you can put whatever size display you want. You can build the, build the system by putting different processing units together. I'll let Jay talk all about that. But what I really like about it is it's common hardware from the soldier to the brigade division headquarters that, that all does the same mission command, battle command stuff. I'm only training one person. Anybody in between can figure out how to hook this stuff up. So, in conclusion, I don't want to get thrown out of here, my recommendation based on my experience with the user and how we do business in the American Army, but I think how we can do business anywhere. Common hardware set makes it easy because you can replace units uh, and have the ability to hook together legacy, current, and future. I think one of the things that we all need and understand is that, and it's been brought up a couple of times this morning already by people much more experienced and senior to myself, is that that common software suite, so we're not trying to take all these disparate softwares, fires, logistics, maneuver, intel, and bring those all together to give us a common picture of what's going on in the battlefield. But folks, I'll tell you, most importantly, most importantly, is working with that user. Once you get the user involved, now they want to take care of that piece of equipment. They believe in that piece of equipment. They will use that piece of equipment. And they will provide you with feedback like you won't believe on what's right and wrong. Bottom line is it gets the right information to the right person in the right format to make the right decision confidently. Everybody who wears a uniform understands what confidence means. There's nothing worse than, it's, than to be in a tactical situation unsure of the commander's intent, unsure of what's expected of you, and then act to ask, ask yourself to act confidently. You won't do it because you don't know what the heck you're doing. But boy, when you do, when you do, God help the guy on the other side who's fixing to have a bad day. So this is the DRS team that's here today. My good friend Ted Devlin, you'll hear from Jay next, and I'm Mike Kelly. 
and thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Mike. Now that uh, he got you all awake, I wanted to tell you, I've just been corrected, it was one hour, 45 minutes, so, but he's got you awake. And I think the most important point he made was that while you have a creative lot of people, it is the equipment and understanding what that user is capable and what he likes. And I think the example he gave of the Samsung Galaxy, which has the human touch or understand, and the way the commercial world has gone, is very relevant and indicates the importance of the user being involved in the development and more importantly the user being taken not as the brightest but as the weakest link stage. Uh, we now have the technical aspects uh, from Mr. Jayesh Shah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. The only way I can speak as loud as Mike is if I start shouting into this microphone. So I'm going to not try to do that. Michael, as he said, he comes with over 30 years of experience in the Army. He provided the user's perspective on it, uh, on the battle command system. My background is pure civilian engineering technologist sitting behind my computer all day long, trying to come up with systems that can be used effectively for battle command. So I'm going to provide a technical perspective on what the battle command system is, what solutions we have developed, and where we are going with help from our user community, help from experts like Mike, and also by talking to a number of officers and uh, people in uh, India about what their needs are. <clears throat> so the very first question anybody would have is why DRS? What's, what, why is DRS uh, talking about battle command? The, reason, the first and foremost reason is our involvement over the last 15 years with the U.S. Army in developing and fielding their FBCB2 system, which is a precursor to all the battlefield digitization that is happening in the world today. Uh, we have learned many lessons during that time. Um, <clears throat> we have proven technology. We have fielded over two lakh systems for the U.S. Army. Uh, so we're not just a box provider. We're a full system capabilities provider. We can integrate and provide solutions that include hardware, software, communications, etc. cetera. Uh, there has been a lot of talk and there has been justifiable concerns about the exportability of uh, systems being acquired from overseas. And I can fully understand that, that the policies sometimes change, the politics sometimes change, and uh, uh, there are concerns. We have been working with the U.S. government uh, in making sure that our systems are fully exportable, um, the technology is exportable, and we are since our involvement with uh, the Indian Army uh, digitization plan, we have been aware of the MTOT, the TOT requirements, and we're fully prepared with that. So the lessons we have learned in these times is that the modularity and configuration flexibility is one of the most critical thing in a battle command system. You want to be able to configure your system to suit your mission your mission, mission does not have to suit what you have in your platform. And in order to do that, you must, must, must minimize your size, weight, and power for integration of your systems into your platform. Uh, General uh, Surindranath, I believe, this morning talked about modernizing platform when you have 30 years old platform and you want to put the new equipment in there. First of all, you don't have space in there because all the space is already taken up by existing equipment. So you must find ways to integrate new technology into it and the only way you can do that is by trying to minimize the impact in the existing platform. Um, this chart shows a number of different solutions we have um, and 
it, it shows that we're focused on providing the best integrated C4 ISR solution, not only to the U.S. Army and the U.K. Army, but to the Indian Army as well. And our systems are designed specifically for that purpose. We're not designing a general purpose system that could be adapted to battle command. We're designing systems that are specifically designed to address battle command needs and sensors. We, we test them to the environmental and EMI condition that you would expect in a battle command system. Uh, what's our legacy? Our legacy on the FBCB2 system over the last 15 years, uh, starting probably around in 1998 to today, has been generations improvement in technology and at the same time, tremendous decreases in cost of the system over the years. And this graphic demonstrates uh, we started out with a modest P3 processor, and now we are up to quad core uh, uh, i7 type of system, while maintaining the same footprint so the platforms don't get affected where the systems are deployed. Uh, shows us uh, some examples of the over 70 different types of platforms we have integrated our systems in, uh, anywhere from track vehicles, wheel vehicles, aerial platforms, naval platforms. So we have been into each environment and performed successfully. I may quote a um, couple of officers. Uh, General Kochar was here this um, a while ago. Um, in his interview last year, uh, he stressed the need for convergence of legacy equipment with new equipment. Just because you're coming up with a new battlefield digitization system does not mean your old systems are going to go away overnight. They need to coexist. They need to work together. So we must ensure the continuity and the operational life of the existing system. He also said that uh, he was a SOI uh, signal officer in chief at the time, and he said the number of wireless and communication technologies are proliferating, and the Indian Army justifiably is considering those technologies, but the challenge is not in purchasing the technology, the challenge is in integrating these technology so that you have a seamless network. Uh, integrated C4 ISR, we have a lot of slides here. I'm going to skip on some of these. A battle command system involves not just buying a computer and a display and a GPS and a radio. It involves a number of different things that must be integrated into the platform. And when you start adding all these different boxes together, you quickly realize that you have a swap, size, weight, and power problem. So you look for ways to integrate this, and DRS is at the forefront of integrating that uh, you start asking question, how much, you know, how much does it weigh? Where am I going to install it? Um, so swap becomes an issue. Uh, DRS, Michael talked about the, our unit called data distribution unit, DDU, which is on the left side there. Uh, and we also have a tablet uh, computer. Um, together, we have incorporated technology in that that collapses a number of external boxes you would otherwise need into a platform, giving you a in tremendous size, weight, and power advantage when you start integrating this system into platforms that are already tightly constrained. Different uh, core component for a battle command system, uh, DDU. The, the one in the middle you see is the Samsung Android phone uh, that Michael just talked about. That is our handheld unit for the soldier at the edge. We, like everybody else, we started out developing a completely ruggedized handheld unit five years ago, and we went through about 10 different iterations till the vice chief of army came out, he raised his iPhone in a big meeting and said, why can't I have this? Why do I need to carry a two kilo small handheld unit that's not going to show me any more than what my iPhone is showing me. So immediately, it's like pushing a reset button. Everybody dropped those plans of developing rugged handles and everybody is developing using technology that the soldier, the young soldiers are already familiar with, as Mike said, and it does not require training to start using that. 
And uh, we have been very successful. The United States Army has been very successful in using that and very pleased with the outcome. Our, we have a complete suite of software uh, specifically designed for Battle Command. We are called uh, C4, uh, C4 Insight. Um, time permitting, we'll talk about that a little more. Um, and the last box you see is the is the next generation of computing and display hardware that the U.S. Army wants to start using going forward next generation battle command system. Some detailed requirement on the DDU and MRT. By the way, these presentation will be available to anybody who wants a copy of it for more details. Uh, so we can start skipping on some of the, the detailed technical of the, of the uh, systems. Uh, one word I would like to point out is that our military rugged tablet uh, that you see in this configuration has been selected and we are very proud of this. Uh, it has been accepted as a tactical computer for the Indian Army's Battlefield Surveillance System, BSS program, Project Sanjay. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fully qualified box, qualified to JSS Penta 5 as well as the American Mill Standard uh, 810Gs and 461Es. The DDU as a box is a is a multifaceted uh, multifaceted system. It acts as a com tactical server. It is based on a powerful quad core processor. The it it is capable of acting as a data router and Ethernet switch up to, with up to 10 Ethernet ports. We are working very closely with Cisco. Uh, in integrating their software into the DDU. The third bullet, cross-banding of the disparate comm system, that is where the power of the DDU is. Uh, as we talked about trying to tie different communication systems together, somebody this morning mentioned that the Air Force communication cannot talk to the, the Army communication, cannot talk to the Navy communication, and that there's a manual component involved in exchanging data or information between those. The DDU is specifically designed to tie disparate type of communications together. So at the, on, a, on a fully configured system, you could have a soldier on a cell phone talking to somebody all the way into the command headquarters on a military communications radio. Or you can have a soldier from his smartphone trying to send a video all the way into the command headquarters. So the DDU is one of the extremely powerful box that has been adapted into the, into the U.S. Army. Um, technical details. Um, MFOX, we have been, uh, we were selected as the sole provider for the MFOX system by the U.S. Army. Uh, more details on what is an MFOX system. MFOX briefly came out of trying to gather requirements from different program offices within the U.S. DOD. And instead of having everybody develop their own hardware and own software and own display system, uh, the U.S. Army decided that they want a common family of computing elements and that's where the MFOX is, and uh, we have been honored to be selected for that. Uh, these are MFOX, the whole premise for MFOX is modular, that you have a common set of modules that can be configured for a system that you need according to your mission. There are three configurations that the U.S. Army is currently looking at, a basic at the edge, intermediate at the intermediate command level, and advanced at the headquarters level. Uh, it's a matter of putting different LRUs together to come up with those systems. And now with the common modular elements, what you have is a very simplified logistics trail. You are maintaining a limited number of common spheres that could be applied many places. You're not carrying disparate computing systems, display systems requiring separate training, separate maintenance schedules, etc. You have a common set that can be used easily. Uh, more description <clears throat> on the MFOX. Now these are detailed description on some of the MFOX LRUs uh, and the technology that we have developed and implemented in there. Uh, in the interest of time, again, I'm going to switch fast through this and I'll be open to questions later if we need to. Um, 
uh, it will have up to three different sizes of display, 12, 15, and 17 inch uh, that can be used at different location in your command structure. Um, other uh, LRUs, solid state hard drives, keyboards, batteries, uh, most important is the rugged environmental specification. We have learned that no matter what, how stringent you put your paper specifications for ruggedness, the real life is usually more rugged than what the paper says. So you must have margins built into your system's environmental specification for it to survive out in the actual working environment. So we pay very close attention to the environmental specifications. And when, when we say that they are in compliance with a specific specification, we mean it. We have an integrated command and control uh, suite of software called C4 Insight. Uh, I'm showing just a few screens here. I'm not showing all of that. Uh, this is the what we call Force Insight. Uh, Force Insight gives you the graphical representation of the battlefield. It is where you track your blue dots and your red dots and your unknowns. It allows you to get sensor feeds directly into the commander screen. It allows you to get videos from uh, unmanned sensor. It allows you to get videos from UAVs. So the commander has all the necessary information at his fingertip without cluttering up the screen with data that becomes overwhelming to, to analyze. The second uh, window is a video manager. Our, our systems are capable of accepting many, many sources of video, UAV, unmanned ground uh, soldier, etc., cetera, um, and able to display those. The third one shows a radio manager, allows the system or the operator to control communication systems from a single point instead of trying to manually adjust all the communications. These are just the detailed desktop that we talked about. Uh, this is the Force Insight which shows you, allows you many capabilities of freehand drawing uh, so they, a commander or somebody can pass the information down to the lower echelon or the upper echelon when a, something of interest needs to be pointed out, out uh, up and down the chain. The video manager, radio manager. Uh, this is the Samsung phone that we talked about. Um, we, are, we are adapting the latest phones as we go along. And our design of the housing is such that the new phones can be easily adapted without having to redesign every time. We're in doing so, we're also making sure that the phone's environmental performance is enhanced. As, as you know, the commercial phones were, was not designed for the military application. So we're, trying, we're adapting it for operations in tactical environment. Uh, there are a number of uh, slides uh, representing some platform integration concepts we have. Mike uh, showed you this concept about the DDU at the center of a, a complete network inside, inside a vehicle, uh, integrating sensors, uh, intercoms, uh, displays, radio systems. And this architecture has been implemented in a number of different platforms, uh, wheel, track, naval. Um, uh, shows you different applications of these uh, these uh, boxes, and uh, again, in in interest of time, I'm going to skip through that. Um, this is how eventually everything ties together into a platform. These are the things that will go into the platform for battle command as well as maintenance. Um, and DRS is involved in all aspects of this this, uh, this architecture. Uh, summary and benefit, we, we offer proven technology with a global leader in providing ultra-rugged uh, uh, systems for battle command. And uh, it, uh, our success lies in the support we have provided to our user community and, the, and it's demonstrated by the U.S. Army's continued uh, continues interest and 
trust in our ability to take them into the next generation of system. I want to thank you for your time. I hope I did not go over the limit. This is our team here today, and we're open for questions when necessary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jayesh, and I think uh, you have stuck to your time. And what is, I think, two aspects is what he mentioned about how the U.S. general wanted an iPhone doing everything. It's the ability of people in India today to jump that generation to get that simple equipment. Uh, you, you've been fortunate not to have been part of the long developmental cycle. And the other aspect is based on needs, how you can determine modules. What are the needs of the lower person? Keep it simple, get more complex. And I think that modular aspect is something that we should definitely look at. Uh, we now go on to the third speaker, uh, who is going to speak on the expectations from the center city in the battlefield. That's General Bhadra. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Even in this compressed time frame, if I take half a minute to trace back the genesis of uh, net centric warfare, you will see that uh, it originated from a very, very simple theory. The theory was networking improves efficiency. It was proved in marketing, it was proved in management. Taking forward this concept on the initiative of uh, the US government, they applied themselves on to how networking can be implemented on military forces and how the <coughs> war fighting efficiency will improve with networking. <coughs> so, in the backdrop of the first Gulf War, 1991, a series of uh, steps were taken to achieve this. The most interesting part is in this past 22 years of evolution, it's a classic case of technology and operational concepts moving hand in hand. At times, the technology opening new vistas for concepts to be evolved for better fighting. And at times, the concept, operational concept demanding and even pushing technology to meet its requirements, which the technology often met. <coughs> now, if you look at what do we want from this net centricity. In very broad terms, this as shown in the slide, Basically, we need a real-time operational picture, a real-time intelligence picture, and a facility for making fast decisions. We have that. Then we have better comprehension of the battlefield, and it lightens the fog and reduces the friction and war. And then it will manifest in information and uh, decision dominance collaborative planning, and self-synchronization. Now, these aspects go beyond the technology of net-centric systems. Uh, it impinges on operational concepts and organizations, which is not the, within the purview of today's uh, presentation. 
However, it is not a matter of concern also because in the past, our commanders at every level have adapted to do new technologies being inducted into the army, armed forces, and they will adapt to net-centric warfare also when the systems are deployed and when they adapt to those systems. <coughs> now, this net-centric warfare facilitated by powerful computers and smart applications on one side and uh, stable networks and communication infrastructure on the other. In addition, it requires high technology sensors and integration of compatible weapons because if you know about the enemy, then it's imperative that you destroy him also at the appropriate time. Again, here again, my focus will be on the first three because sensors and weapons are beyond the scope of discussion. Now, taking these expectations to a slightly greater granularity, the operational dividends we expect from net center cities, first is the real-time operational picture. The first three, the status and deployment of own forces and uh, status of personal weapons and equipment, forecast requirement, these are all uh, common features in any automated system, it must be there. In addition, we require real-time status of the enemy deployment movements. This is where the sensors come in, and uh, more the number of sensors, more information you get. At the same time, net the systems should not be <coughs> demanding that we litter the battle space with sensors. So the application should be such, would be such, that <coughs> it will facilitate focusing the available sensors into identified enemy courses. Second aspect of uh, <coughs> net centricity is uh, computer assisted operational planning. Assisted terrain analysis with uh, high resolution maps, with the kind of digital mapping which is possible today, uh, virtually every military attribute can be thrown up by the system. Be it dominating heights, built up areas, obstacles, uh, avenues of approach, corridors, killing areas, delay lines, everything can be thrown up by the system. <coughs> analysis of enemy courses for a given course, it will do, it can do time and space analysis. I'm not getting into the larger realm of uh, wargaming and things like that. <coughs> it will also do the simple mathematical aspects of planning and implementation of induction and build-up. Continue with the computer assisted operation planning. It will auto-compute all aspects of uh, combat support requirement like bridging, breaching, engineer planning, most aspects of fire support, fire missions, and auto-computing and logistic plans. And during the context stage, real-time surveillance of the enemy and his reactions, time and space analysis for application of reserves, facilitate preemptive measures and synchronized degradation. Basically, the approach for automation is that anything which is uh, purely mathematical is fully automated, especially the logistic aspects, because uh, things like uh, stocking, build-up, replenishment, mobilization, everything will be fully automated and it will be given in a platter to the MGOL of a command. Anything which, is, which requires human intervention because the cognitive skills are required, it will be partially automated. This is fire planning, engineer support plan, this will be partially automated. Anything which is predominantly uses the cognitive uh, skills of human intelligence, tools for facilitating such planning, that is operational planning, decision support regarding uh, application of reserves, these will be, tools will be provided. This is the basic framework in which <coughs> net synthetic applications will be built. And before I proceed, I want to say that these are not a wish list. These are the th aspects which are being implemented in the projects which are in progress under the DG informed systems. 
Now comes coming to the technical aspects of the, what is the system requirement. And unfortunately in this, it is what I'm going to say is what should be there and what would, not what would be there because there are certain gaps to be bridged. Basic constituents, as mentioned earlier, are the computers, communication and networks, and software application. In addition, what was not mentioned, two more things come into play. That is the geographical information system and geospatial data, and cybersecurity systems, which are important constituents of uh, data centric systems. <coughs> Here, I want to put a caution that the power of net centricity is not derived from either the network or the computers. It is derived from the application. So the application is the most important constituent. I can see some people of Bharat Electronics smiling there. <clears throat> from the expectations of the computer, they should be power efficient and swap constrained. The swap stands for size, weight, and power. Because uh, we have to keep the signature and footprint of our systems as low as possible. Surely we have to grant that uh, the enemy also will try to achieve battlefield transparency and if we keep our footprint and signature high, we are giving ourselves into his hands. So there is a requirement to have very low signature, that is lower size, smaller size, lighter in weight and consuming less power. If you carry bulk systems to the battlefield, you will require heavy air conditioners to keep them cool and heavy generators to, to power them and it will all be a giveaway. We want our computing hardware to, in different form factors starting from wearable systems all the way to <coughs> main full-fledged servers. because. For deriving maximum efficiency from uh, networking, right from the soldier and platforms upward should be networked. <coughs> We're looking at integrated ruggedized unit and the wearable systems and handheld systems which are used by soldiers and lower level commanders should have night readability on the display. They cannot have illuminated displays. <coughs> as far as the communication, the networks are concerned, the bias should be on non-emitting media and needs to amplification because if your media is not emitting, it is less prone to be interfered with and less prone to be intruded into. I'll come more on this a little later. <clears throat> it should be complemented because you cannot do with uh, just non-emitting media. It should be complemented with short range uh, manet configured radio sets. <coughs> As far as uh, bandwidth is concerned, we have to have a practical approach to the bandwidth requirement. It is preferable to have good bandwidth at the same time have the application so designed to be able to work in a low bandwidth scenario also. <coughs> Contemporary quality of service features like prioritization, multicast and all should be there. And most importantly, it should be secure because <coughs> in the when our uh, armed forces get into the net centric uh, cultures the networks would become a prime source of combat power and if it becomes a prime source of combat power by <coughs> corollary it will become a focal target of the enemy also so therefore if it is not secured it become a critical vulnerability or a central gravity. So therefore, it is very important to secure these networks. And here, I am coming back to the type of media. This is why one more reason why the bias should be on non-emitting media. And hopefully, we are moving in the right direction in that. <coughs> now comes the most important thing, the application software. The application software has to be lean and mean. Unless it is lean and mean, it will hog a resource and it will defeat our drive to have lean hardware, swap hardware. It will require more computing resources, CPU load, memory load, more power. 
<coughs> no frill, no nonsense. Bare essential features to be given into the system. There is a tendency to have a lot of middleware applications to ease the process of application development. This middleware is another resource hogging entity. Middlewares, if possible, should be avoided. If they cannot be avoided and have to be used, it should be customized to call out any feature that is not required in our applications so that they consume less resource. <coughs> Lastly, they should meet the, the requirement of bandwidth awareness because in the tactical battle area, the network is going to be a little fickle. It is not going to be as stable or as steady as we see in the <coughs> peacetime networks. So the application should be able to detect the bandwidth conditions and they accordingly exchange data. If the bandwidth is poor, don't send video stream. That the application should be aware of that. It should be capable of distinguishing that. Lastly, the geographical information systems, it has got two components. Most often we combine both. First is the GIS application and second is the GIS data. GIS applications have come a long way. Today we have very powerful GIS applications. In fact, too powerful for military use. It needs to be customized and hardened. <coughs> the important aspects are it should be common across all applications because otherwise it will create interoperative problems when you are trying to exchange <coughs> uh, GIS data. It should be scalable because the same GIS will have to be used in your tablets, wearable computers, handheld computers, and also in the <coughs> client system, main client systems. The concern is on the GIS data. We don't have, with the military, we don't have uh, contemporary digital maps with high resolution data. This needs to be created for efficient exploitation of net-centric systems. It should contain topology information. It should have tiled architecture so that it doesn't consume too much of resources. So this needs to be evolved on priority. Now, uh, before I conclude, I just wanted to apprise this audience about the network centric systems which are in the annual being developed within the Army. We have this five uh, projects constituting the what we call as the taxi 3i system, that is tactical command, and command control and communication system. The hub is the CIDS, that is the command information and decision support system. It is a command chain system running from a unit all the way up to the core. <coughs> and this is where all the decision support for combat is included. Next, we have the Artillery Combat Command and Control System, ACCCS, which is basically automating all aspects of artillery fire support and implementation of fire missions. It is already fielded. Incidentally, CIDS is in the fire, uh, midway to, through development and possibly by the June next year, we'll have some system in place. Electronic warfare system is uh, obvious. I don't have to say anything. ADCNR is... Uh, Air Defense Command and Control, uh, Control and Reporting System. We have made a test bed. It is under the final stages of internal validation and probably in ja January it will go for field trials. Battlefield Surveillance System is also under development. By June next year, we should have some system in place for testing, internal testing. Now, I like, like I mentioned, this goes up to the core and down till the battalion. And above the core, Carrying into the Army headquarters is the project Asteroids. There was a, a project being undertaken by some agency in the past, which has been foreclosed because it is not meeting our requirements, and now we are going for a fresh project. And this is the one which will carry all the command chain information from to the core headquarters to the Army headquarters and also link with the inter services automation system as and when it is in place. Now, coming down from the Battalion is the battlefield management system. This has been categorized as a make project by Indian industry and uh, hopefully within a week or so, week 10 days, we'll be inviting the impaneled industries for 
handing over the expression of interest. So with all these projects, probably um, an optimistic estimate, by the end of the 12th plan, 2017, we'll, have, we'll start fielding our systems. That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Badran. Uh, when I was looking at all the expectations which you had put down so logically and beautifully, I think one aspect which needs to be included, and that is in keeping with Mike, what Mike said about that 40 hours training, as also the kind of apprehension certain commanders at all levels have, is that we must incorporate in all these battlefield management systems simulation and training and assessment packages. Because wherever you have such systems, to make it interesting, make the training interesting, to assess a person whether he's fit to operate at different levels. You mentioned about scalability. And also, not only for the person operating, but for the commander to understand its potential, these training and simulator packages which are primarily software driven, must, in my opinion, be included because that is what will really make you give the efficacy or be proof of the ability of the personnel to hide. And in this, you could factor in all these aspects of security uh, and also, uh, you know, the various other inputs uh, which would come in, like jamming. Or so I think this uh, simulator package should also be. A training and simulator package should also be a part of the expectation. But thank you, that was very good. And now we go on to the making of a digital warrior uh, from Samir. We've talked of the air warrior, we've talked of the land warrior, we've talked of the sea warrior. So now we've got wait with great expectations as to what the digital warrior is. <laughs> 